say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. Hello everyone and welcome to a new direction. My name is Jay Izzo and wow! We do we have a great show. I am telling you what, ladies and gentlemen, yes sir, yes ma'am, this show is for you. Holy cow, the book we brought. Okay, listen, here's the deal. I, We had Dr. Tara Peters, who is the co-author of this book called The Demotivated Employee. Oh, ho, 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 what a great book. Folks, you need to buy this book. This book is absolutely outstanding. I'm telling you, uh, we're going to talk a lot about it. So when Tara was on, we didn't get very far into the book. Matter of fact, we didn't talk. We, we got so stuck in one area that we didn't get very far. And I was like, would you like to come back on the show? And she said, yeah. And then her friend co-author, Dr. Kathy Bush, says, hey, I'd like to do that too. So we said, well, how about having you both on? And then we went, okay, let's do that. So now they're both on. We're here. We're going to be doing the demotivated employee. And what fitting, fitting uh, time it is to talk about this because folks we're in the midst of a pandemic and you know what demotivation man that is just a huge term a huge word and i'm telling you these two uh, genius brilliant women are going to help you ceos uh, managers uh, small business owners medium-sized business owners you really need to pay attention to what they're saying today get your friends on the phone get your get your friends tell them you got to be watching this right now you got to be listening to this right now because uh they are going to help you immensely but before we get to them let's do what we do every week right and you know what that is i'm going to check in with you on your training in the four areas of your life how are you doing with your training right because here's the here's the deal right the, the truth of the matter is you're only as good as your training when you're exhausted, when you're under pressure, when you are being attacked on every different level, you know what? You rely on your training. Where did I learn that? Well, I learned that from Special Operations Forces guys who, who've who been on this show, who've talked about, you know, when you're tired, exhausted, and you're under fire, right, you you rely on your training. Well, if you aren't training right now, your training is only so good, which means you're going to probably fall apart. And we have four areas of our life that we have got to work on, right? Physical, the mental, the emotional, and spiritual. All right? We've got to work on those four areas. So I check in with you to see how you're doing with your training in those four areas of your life. And we rate them on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being miserable, 10 being absolutely the best you can be. And then wherever that number is, and it's not important what the number is. It's just to give us a guide to know where we can improve. You know, what are you going to do? We ask these questions. What are you going to do to improve it, right? Right now, what can you do to change it? And then, you know, going forward, right, you know, what is going to be that plan? going forward, right? So so we do the first area is the physical area, right? And I ask you about your training. And what I ask you about when it comes to your training is this, right? How are, how's your exercise naturally? How's your diet? How are you drinking enough water? Are you getting enough sleep, right? Those are four of the things that you could be doing to enhance your training, right? And if you're doing it right and you're enhancing your training right, then what happens is, is that, you know what, you're able to get stronger. You're able to deal with more, right? If you're dealing with the physical, I had one of my clients call me this morning and said, you know what? I haven't been in the gym in so long. I just went back to the gym. I feel great. I feel like I can handle so much more. See, that's, that's what training does for you. Even on the physical life, he said, my brain just feels clear and more open. Right. So whatever your number, scale of one to 10, what is your number right now? Everybody out there, what, where, do you, where do you believe that you're at on that scale? All right. And then whatever that number is, how do you get to the next number? Not to 10, just to the next number. All right. So that's the physical. The second area is what we call, right, the, the, the mental area. And what are we talking about here? What's mental training? Well, reading a book is mental training right? It's not about letting things come at you. It's not about absorbing news. That's not, that's not active learning in your brain. We're talking about active learning, actively challenging how you are doing what you're doing in your brain. That We're talking about wisdom here. We're talking about gaining understanding of things. We're talking about learning. We're talking about learning something new. We're talking about actively engaging mentally, right, in our brains, Right? I mean, I'm, not, I'm not talking about reading fiction. I'm talking about reading things that actually help us grow. Because the truth of the matter is, as my wife reminds me on a regular basis, you're either growing or you're dying. None of us stand still. And mentally, that is true. This, this, this is a truth as well. You've got to stay on top of it mentally. 
So on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being miserable, 10 outstanding. How are you doing mentally in your training? All right, you got two numbers. Now the third number, the emotional number, right? There's two, there's two avenues I look at emotionally when it comes to evaluating your emotional number. You know, we use psychological professionals. We like to use things like emotional quotients or emotional intelligence. But the truth of the matter is, I, I'll, I'll just break it down real two ways. One is, how is your training going when it comes to intentionally being able to control your emotions? And what I mean by that is when somebody cuts you off in traffic, when something comes out at you over, you know, when something just hits you out of nowhere, right? How well are you able to control your emotions? Because here's, here's something I learned. I'm learning. I'm learning. I should say I'm not, I haven't learned it yet, but I'm learning. Do you know when I am emotionally at my worst is when I'm at my selfishest. I don't know if there's such a word as selfishist, but <laughs> I, I, I just threw it out there. But when I when I am most selfish is when I am at my worst emotionally. Because when it's not about me, I can handle the emotions much better. When I am in gratitude, I handle my emotions much better. And so part of my I'm realizing and part of my emotional training is I gotta be more grateful and I gotta be less selfish. Because it's just not about me. That's the first part of your of your emotional training. The second part of your emotional training is being able to tap into the emotions of other people. What that's going to require is, A, you're going to have to be in the moment, meaning that you're going to have to listen. And then I would expand your emotional vocabulary so that you have a range of emotions that you can understand. And empathy is different than sympathy. Right? It's not feeling sorry for somebody. It's being able to tune in and walk in their shoes. So as far as your emotional training goes on a scale of 1 to 10, and with those being your goals, how would you say your emotional training is going? And then finally, there's the spiritual area. And what, what's the spiritual area? Well, the spiritual area is this, right? The spiritual area is if you remove the mental, the, the physical, and the emotional, you move that out of the way, whatever you have left is the spiritual. And a lot of people will say, I'm not very spiritual, but you are. Because if you have plans for even tomorrow or the next hour, that means you have faith that they're going to happen. And if you have faith, that's spirituality. I don't care what what you say. If you believe that you're going to do something tomorrow, you have faith that that's going to happen because it hasn't happened yet, but you believe that it will. That's faith is spirituality. Not only is it that, but it, you know, it also is sometimes for, you know, it's what brings you back to center for people that can walk in nature and they feel like they're back to center for people. It's belief in God for, for some people that they, they believe in meditation or, or something else, right? The, the point of the matter is this, right? Spirituality is generally pretty individual, right? But as I often say, you know what? Being spiritual is not about going to church and thinking about fishing. Being spiritual is going fishing and thinking about God. That's it's spiritualist. So on a scale of one to 10, how's it working for you? Five is average, right? So now what you have here is you have your four areas of your life and you got to think of each number as like the legs of a chair. And, he, and if the chair is uneven, right? And you sit in that chair, it's really bad on your posture. By the same token, if the chair is too low, right? You can't sit at a table and eat. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring up in balance all four of those legs. And then what we're trying to do is we're also trying to eat at that level that we're perfect at doing. And speaking of two outstanding ladies who are well-balanced and have their act totally together, I want to introduce you to uh, Drs. Kathy Bush and Tara Peters. Uh, Kathy, Dr. Kathy Bush has spent the past few decades investigating the development of leaders as consultant, professor, coach, researcher, and author. She's worked with leaders from all around the world and across many industries and is dedicated to helping leaders understand the important role that play in the creating work, great workplaces. Kathy lives with her husband in Cocoa, uh, Florida and with, and has two sons. And then we have Tara, Dr. Tara Peters, and she is a gifted educator who believes there is no greater calling than educating our future generations. She has worked as an international consultant, co-authored an Amazon bestselling book and presented scholarly work at regional, national, and international uh, conferences. She currently serves as academic dean of the Texas campus and professor in the DeVos Graduate School at the Northwood University. Tara lives in Cedar Hill, Texas, loves to travel the world uh, with her son, and I feel like I'm missing something else. Oh, yeah, she has a TED Talk that you need to check out. <laughs> 
yeah, that's the other part of the other thing. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Doctors uh, Bush and Peters, and then uh, ladies, welcome to a new direction. Thanks so much, Jay. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So excited to have this conversation yeah, with you today. Yes. Yeah, so this is going to be awesome. First of all, I've never had two people on the show at the same time. This is the first time I've ever done that. So that's pretty cool. So people who are watching live or listening, uh, wherever you're listening, you know, including 93.5 FM, uh, the Oak. Oh, that's right. I got to do the classic radio voice. 93.5, the Oak. <laughs> right. I have to do that. Um, <clears throat> thank you for listening. Um, and then of course, everybody on CastBox FM and live and everywhere else you're listening. The book is called The Demotivated Employee. You guys have written a great book here. I, I love this book. We're in the midst of a pandemic um, as you and as we're all talking here. Uh, but before we get to that, there's something that I, I want to say. I, I'm, I'm a coach and I you know regularly get the question, how do I motivate my employees? And I've had a lot of guests on the show uh, between the time that Tara was on and and today, where they every psychologist, psychiatrist I've had on the show has said, well, you can't motivate your people. You, you, you're just not going to motivate them. And I give them that. I, matter of fact, since Tara, I have given them this answer. You're asking the wrong question. Don't ask the question, how do I motivate my people? Find the things that are demotivating them and remove those. Is that a fair answer? Uh, Kathy, it let's is. start with you. Yeah, it is. You know, um, Tara and I like to talk about the basket analogy. So if you think about people showing up to do a job or, or for the you know first day of a task, um, they tend to come in. Let's imagine they have a basket. Um, we think it's empty. We think it's our job as managers, leaders to put stuff in the basket, call that motivation. And if we do that right, then they're going to be gung ho and productive. But the truth is that they show up with a full basket. They have all sorts of things already motivating them. And so our job is to prevent the stuff that gets in the way and causes the basket to start to leak, if you think about it that way. And so, right, um, what you said to the people that you uh, just mentioned is accurate. It's like if you could figure out what's poking holes in their basket mm. and not do that or repair that quickly, then you will have highly motivated people. You don't have to put motivation in. You have to keep the motivation that's there. So this 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 is a, this is an interesting thing because I think what happens is for most leaders Tara I think what happens for at least the leaders that I coach and have talked to is they have a hard time dealing with removing what they're doing because they want me to come in and you know, probably like you right they want you to come in and do something to jazz their people up to make them, you know, happier, brighter, or whatever. I don't, I, they feel, I feel like sometimes they think I'm a magician. I really do. I think, <laughs> right, I, I feel like they think, oh, well, you're, you're the, you're the psychological professional. Come on in and just to go inside their brains and do something. And, you know, but it, it really is the removal of the, the crud, right? Why do, why do you think that leaders have such a hard time letting go of the things that they've put in place that actually stop their employees from being motivated. Yeah, so I think one of the things that that's at issue is that um, it requires us to be um, reflective and to figure out how we might actually be contributing to the problem. And that isn't necessarily our first inclination to think that I might be doing something. Uh, my natural inclination may be to blame you, Jay, right? It's everybody, your fault, well, you, know? well, you might as well, everybody else does. So you might as well blame me. <laughs> You're just lousy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to shift that responsibility onto you instead right. of stepping back and saying, OK, I'm a part of this you know, situation, too. Is there something that I might be doing that might be contributing to the situation you know, that, that Jay is in? Because, you know, Kathy, now we start from this, this premise that, OK, first of all, when you hire people, most of us say, oh, we hire only the best and the brightest. So, right. so let's start there. So you had a good group of people coming in, right? And they were they were ready to go and then something's happened. So, I mean, you can't just blame the people. I mean, we are really trying to force leaders to say, okay, let me really take a step back and let me say, okay, what's really going on here? And is there anything that I might be doing? Is there something that I'm not understanding about the situation? Mm. 
where I could actually address it with the uh, with the employee. And so I think that that's the hard part is people actually being able to take ownership and find that they might be a part of the issue. And so causing people to do that and having that inclination first, as opposed to, you know, pointing the finger to blame is, is where I would argue is, is where the challenge comes in. You, you know, I, I got to be honest with both of you. You know, I love the premise of this demotivating thing. And you talk about in this book that nobody talks about demotivation, right? I mean, every, everybody talks about the motivational piece, you know, how do we motivate, but nobody talks about demotivation. But I think this is the brilliant part of your book, uh, both of you have written, is that, you know, <laughs> and I was thinking about this the other day, when people, you know, when people get a job, all right, or they get a new place to go, right? I mean, they are so excited about going to work, right? Nobody goes, oh, I got a new job. God, it's going to suck. Nobody ever says that, right? Up front. I mean, they go, man, I am so excited about working here. I, I can't believe, you know, what a great place to work. And the first few weeks go on and they go, man, I love this place. These people are awesome. I love them. Oh, man, it's like a family here. Six months later, I cannot stand this place. Yeah, six months if you're lucky. Sometimes six yeah, right, days. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. right. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. right. But this is the, the, the there's something that happened, yeah. right? And, Go ahead. And, and we, would, we would agree with that, right? There is something that actually takes place during that time span that took you from this employee who was highly motivated and who was engaged, and then you see it slumping, right? Mm -hmm. You see it deteriorating. You see this employee, you know, checked out. You see this employee, you know, calling in sick to work. Um, you saw this, you see this employee uh, missing meetings. I mean, there's a whole host of, of behaviors that you begin to notice about the employee where you see this change. I think what's interesting sometimes is that the change is subtle. And if you're not really paying attention, you may miss it. Mm -hmm. um, and then to, to Kathy's point, you know, the employee is actually, you know, um, thinking of walking out the door and actually then the thought becomes, you know, I'm actually out of here. So right. um, there, there is a something that happens and, and that the, that's something we actually talk about in the book around, you know, the, the sources that we think explain right. what's happening to an extent to that employee. Kathy, would you add to that? I would, yeah. I was just thinking about, you know, the question you asked Tara a minute ago what's going on with these leaders who who know maybe there are things tricks if you will that they can do gimmicks that they can pull out uh, magic out of their hat uh, or they can get the consultants to do that for them and it will cause this utopia of great motivation <laughs> at all times and high performance high productivity great job satisfaction and that's really not how anything works right, right. so we as individuals control a lot of these emotional states our motivation our satisfaction our happiness um, those are things that we have control over as individuals. And so that's always going to be dynamic. What you don't want is for somebody who's up here to go and like drop way off. Um, and especially uh, Tara answered, uh, you know, the issue about blame, especially this is so common. We see people lose motivation, but you don't want to just wipe your hands of it as if, oh, well, that happened um, right. because there are things we can do. And so really, that's where our excitement comes from as um, Tara and I started writing the book and even before that, talking to all the different leaders in our audience, um, all the various people that we've had the chance to work with over years um, as professors and, and consultants, we've had a chance to have these conversations like, well, OK, maybe that person you know, lost their mojo or got distracted by something else right. in their personal life. But maybe there's something that you have contributed. And even if you didn't cause it, and certainly we know you, the leader, didn't mean to because you want your people to be productive. So you right. didn't want to cause demotivation. But even if all that's true, there could be something you could do to fix the problem. And right. so really, that's what we have our energy on. It's like, let's spend a minute and, and instead of just going, yep, lost that one, back up and go, all right, what caused this? What are these sources of demotivation? Which one or multiple ones mm -hmm. may be in play here? And then what can I do? And so for us, our energy is, you know, whatever caused it, let's figure out what a leader can do to help fix it. Right. Um, and there are lots and lots of things you can do. So don't wipe your hands clean of the problem. Do something about it. 
That's awesome. And to kind of add to that a little bit, Jay, I mean, Kathy and I wrote this. We are not cynical. We kind of talked about this the first time. So we don't think (laughs) that, you know, leaders are coming to work to intentionally, like, make your life a living hat. Right. They're they they're really not in the business of doing that. That <laughs> that working is everything that they're trying to accomplish. But they might just be doing it intentionally. They might be ignorant or oblivious right. to it. Or or maybe that's what they think is the right thing to do because that's what they learned. That's how they were trained. That's how everybody that they know does it that's been right. successful. And so they think that that's the way uh, to go. And so the Kathy's point, we say, okay, we actually want to help you because right. we know that this isn't really what you want to see happen with right. people. Yeah. The, the book is called The Demotivated Employee, and you are listening to both uh, doctors, uh, Kathy Bush, Tara Peters, here on a new direction. Hey, everyone, listen, you know what? You know, I've got these two great sponsors uh, that are absolutely fantastic, right? One is the Epic Physical Therapy. They're my physical therapist. As a matter of fact, I'm going back, got an injury, got to go back and see him again, you know, because, you know, I just won't give it up, man. I got to still work out hard and do what I've got to do. Listen, I don't care who you are, whether you're somebody who's still trying to get it done like I am, or whether you're an elite professional athlete, whether you're recovering from an injury or surgery, maybe it's everyday aches and pains, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Here's the deal. The elite team at Epic Physical Therapy will provide you with a customized treatment program tailored to your individual needs. Look, they, they understand how to rehab the most elite athletes. I know I've been in there with them. It's amazing. So when you're ready for epic relief, epic recovery, and epic results, look no further. Go to epicpt.com. That's E-P-I-C-P-T.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors, you know what? They help people all over the world. How do they help people all over the world when they're in the Raleigh, North Carolina area? Here's why. They've been around for 35 years. All right, they've made relationships with the best real estate professionals all over the world because they're unaffiliated with any national brand. They are their own brand. And in a 35 years time, they have literally found the best experts all over the world to help people buy and sell their homes. That That's that's what they do because they create relationships and in those relationships, even with professionals, even with their, even with their clients, their past clients, their current clients and their future clients, you know what they say about them? They say that their customer service is legendary and, and you know what it is. I didn't make that up. That's what they say, right? So listen, if you're looking for that legendary relationship customer service experience, Look no further than, than Linda Craft and Team Realtors. And you can learn more by going to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we're back here on A New Direction with Drs. Tara Peters and uh, and uh, Kathy Bush. And uh, the book is entitled The Demotivated Employee. And we've been kind of talking about uh, some of the things, at least up front, you know, getting prepared to talk about uh You know, what demotivates us? And, you know, you both have written in chapter two, you wrote, you know, that there are five sources of demotivation. There's individual differences, workspace stress, organizational culture, conflict between coworkers and leadership style. Those are the five that um, that you talk about. So um, let's let's start with who do we start with? Let's start with Tara this time. Tara, let's talk about individual differences a little bit. What are some individual differences that contribute to a source of demotivation? And and then how do we overcome those? Yeah, so one of the things that's interesting is um, out of the five sources, this is the one that we attribute to the individual employee. The the others are more, uh, we focus really more on the external or really looking at the leader. But we make an argument that just because this is the ownership of the individual primarily doesn't mean that the leader can can you know just say well I'm hands off it's not my problem that that's you that's how you're hardwired and so you go figure it out so we we thought it was important to recognize that you and I as Kathy was saying earlier because we own our motivation there are also individual components of who we are like our personality that can affect how we feel about the work that we're doing that can impact our motivational level. And so, you know, one of the things in addition to thinking about personality um, and how that might impact. So if I, you know, if I'm normally a person who, who's introverted, right? And so I get my energy from spending some time working by myself in quiet places, those kinds of things. Doesn't mean that I'm not social, but that's where my preference is. If I'm thrust into a new role that requires really me to be more out front and, and engaging and 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 having to do more of that 
type of work with others and I lose this time for my quiet space, that can, again, um, cause me to, to lose my motivation. But one of the things that's interesting really in this time that we talk about that I think is most relevant in terms of the individual differences is really this sense of competence. Um, because as we think about the demands of COVID right now, we are asking people to learn new skills in a relatively short period of time. And we are asking them to be really adept at demonstrating their competence in those skills in a very short period of time. And so being educators, you know, one of the things that we know is, is, is pre-COVID, 70%, Bloomberg was writing an article about this in early March, 70% of higher ed faculty had not taught online. <laughs> and suddenly we, we turned off the lights and said, we're not gonna be face-to-face, -face, go online. And so you have faculty, you know, who were like, okay, you know, I'm in this brand new space and face-to-face -face is not like online. Um, it, it's a different model, requires a different structure. And so you have people who were, you know, again, experts in their area and very skilled and gifted. And now they're being asked to do something very different and imagine, not only just navigating the change and how taxing that is, but I was a star in the classroom and now I'm in this online space and I'm really struggling yeah. and how that can really affect how, you know, an employee is feeling about their job that they once loved, but now they don't feel like they can really, they feel like they're cut out for it, that they're really up to the task. And so how important the, it is in, it is for the leader, in this case, it might be a dean or a provost to come in and say, okay, we're going to support you faculty. You don't have to figure this out by yourself. We're here to help you. And here are the things that we're going to do to assist you, right? In addition to the training, we're going to check in with you. You're going to make sure you have the technology. We're going to help you to get comfortable with it. We're going to be practice sessions, all those right. kinds of things so that people can get comfortable and, you know, regain their sense of capability, right? That, yes, I can do this. And so um, that's really where I think in this point in time that the whole individual difference piece um, really magnifies itself because this issue around the change and the demands that it's made on us has really been impactful in terms of the, the kind of work that we're doing and, and what this book means for leaders. You know, you make a really good point. You know, with this pandemic, we, we've got some huge, and we are seeing a lot of individual differences, aren't we, in terms of demand on our cognitive uh, resources, right? And, you know, I have, I have said all along, you know, as somebody who taught for 20 plus years in colleges and universities, you know, if you're not in front, if you're not, if you don't have some fun behind the camera, you know, you, you're going to struggle as an instructor. I mean, the fact of the matter is we do this show live and you're all on here, right? And, and I know that people are listening to this and they can't see the show. Now you can go to Facebook and you can go to my page and you can watch the show again if you want to see it, but you will see, if you do that, you will see uh, Dr. Peters, Tara, uh, what she did is, as I do, is she's using her hands. She's leaning into the thing. She's doing things where she's so comfortable in front of the camera, which by the way, your Instagram page is fabulous. And anyway, so <laughs> she's, she's in front of the camera, but you know, she's passionate about it. And I think, you know, that's a piece that's often missing as part of that individual differences because we're having to make this adjustment that, you know, here are these knowledgeable people that are forgetting about their passion. They're so worried about being in front of the camera that they're going, it's your passion, you know, whatever you're teaching, this is your passion, right? Let that unleash. And I think, you know, uh, getting people to get used to it, I think is just one piece of that. But I do think the individual differences are extraordinary. Uh, and I think there's something that, um, you know, you talk about competence and mismatch of expectations. I, you know, I think, I don't know, where this fits in exactly. I know it's somewhere between individual differences and the other four, but fundamental attribution error is one of my most favorite psychological concepts ever. Okay. And, and, and it's something that we do typically to people. And that is we attribute some personality defect when the fact of the matter is there's something physical going on within the environment that is actually contributing to whatever the behavior is. And we make this horrible, horrible, uh, we make this horrible presumption that they, you know, if <laughs> I give the example of my psychology classes when I was teaching, you know, you see the car weaving in the road, right? And you're going, oh, they're there. You know what? They're just an idiot, stupid driver, probably drunk, right? And then there, you see them weaving and finally they get off the road 
they get out and a big giant bumblebee flies out of the of the car right and then you kind of feel like a jerk you know for going oh, what wasn't their personality nor were they drunk i was just an idiot because i didn't see the bee in the car this is often true in the demotivation process is not uh and i'm going to ask you kathy in the demotivation process isn't this this is often true with these other areas including the individual differences sometimes we make put blame on people's personality when it in fact is is really not but then when it gets down to some of the other pieces that we talk about in terms of workplace stress right we we can we can make that same fundamental attribution error we can actually anywhere so um you bring up a really important phenomenon most of us don't spend any time thinking about it but we all probably play a role whether it's seeing the crazy driver or something else <laughs> so we notice other people i'm, I'm going to ask your listeners just think for a minute about somebody not you somebody else who you've seen lose motivation i i bet you could easily identify a couple people who were motivation was pretty high and then all of a sudden you started noticing and eh, you know they skipped a meeting or two they they didn't get something done when they said they were going to or at their highest level of competence you've seen people lose motivation so fundamental attribution error would be you say to when you see that oh my gosh terry he's a lazy bum right <laughs> right, right right what what a slacker terry right. is right because you would assume there's something wrong with terry and that's why he loses motivation but but if you had the same thing happen and you started kind of trickling away and not attending to things at the high level of detail or maybe skipping some meetings your explanation would be um, you know, something going on in the environment around you, right? So right. we would we don't say I'm a lazy bum and that's really why I lost motivation. We tend to explain it with the conditions around us. So under under all of the things that we observe, when we notice people losing motivation, we tend to fail to go, wonder what's causing that with an open mind, with some grace, you know, with an assumption that they're not jerks, right? right, right. So we we tend to fail to do that across the board. And so um, if we spend the time as leaders, coworkers, parents, friends, coaches, um, if we go, all right, let me help figure out what caused this, right. then we wouldn't be making this attribution error. We'd be understanding. And probably we would come up with, it could be an individual difference. Um, I, I was thinking as Tara was talking about it, I talk to people all the time about their work from home life. Mm. Uh, now that's starting to transition back a bit more. Right. But when I talk to people who are very extroverted, they're not so happy with the work from home life. They are not yeah. getting enough social activity. Their personal extroversion is hurting right now, right? right? So those people, when you talk to them, there's an external cause. I may notice that they're slacking, but there's a reason why that's going on. So again, helping people figure that out, that's great. All right, so any of these sources that we're gonna talk about today could be the cause, and we may right. make the error that you know just sort of blames people rather than recognizing maybe a cause a useful thing to look at if you're going to help somebody get over their motivational slump so the, the workplace stress piece i i don't you know i kind of you know at the beginning of the show i go through your training in the four areas of your life and you even talk both of you talk about you know that chronic stress we i mean it's a huge hazard As a matter of fact it was it was the world health organization said that the biggest uh you know the biggest uh, was it, epidemic is is stress right and you talk about in the book about chronic stress as a health hazard increased blood pressure type 2 di diabetes people not eating well lacking exercise priorities prioritizing work um, over you know balance letting go of healthy habits of exercise nutrition and you give some fabulous statistics there's 120,000 deaths every year attributable to workplace stress um, that was the hella buck study from 2017 disengaged workers cost as much as 500 billion dollars per year um, and so there is a number of statistics that support workplace stress. How do we, we know it exists and it exists in a lot of forms. And some people will say, well, you know, it's an individual difference of how I deal with stress. I'm going to let whoever wants to go with this, whoever wants to go, wants to take this. But what, what is your response to workplace stress? Is it, is it, is it real? Is it the same for everybody? How do we manage it? What's the, what should we be doing? How can we affect it as leaders? And I'm going to let you guys kind of fight this one out amongst yourselves. What do you think? Well, I'll get started. And then Tara, uh, please jump in and, and add. The, so the first thing I just want to say is, I mean, stress is a part of our work lives. Um, as, as we like to say, that's what you get, get paid the big bucks for. Like if everything was easy, <laughs> 
we wouldn't need high, uh, highly skilled, highly competent people, right? We'd let robots do it. So stress comes from all sorts of sources, but oftentimes it comes from things being difficult. Uh, so what matters actually is not sort of uh, preventing all possible sources of stress. That's it's kind of a silly notion and, and maybe not even very useful. And stress can actually be helpful in our motivation, right? It gives us right. some endorphins, it gets us going. Uh, so it's just how do we help people whose stress levels have gotten so high that they cannot maintain their level of motivation and productivity? How do we help them so that that doesn't just drop their motivation off the cliff, right? And so how do we help a person process that as a source of demotivation, because it will. You know, uh, one of the things that I like to say when I um, talk about this topic is that uh, often our very, very capable, our very competent people are the ones we go to, especially in tough times. Mm -hmm. So we have these super high performing people who are, by the way, doing their job, plus a few other things because they're the people we go to for everything, right? And right. then we have a, a tough thing. And then we add that to their plate and we know they're going to give it their all, right? And so we are causing stress when we do that. Again, we don't want them to lose motivation. We just want them to do their great job as they always do. But um, how do you help a person? And a lot of times it's really about acknowledging them, uh, their stress level and helping them unpack some of the effects of that stress. So caring about them, not pretending like, don't be cavalier about it. Don't pretend like they shouldn't be stressed. That's kind of the damaging stuff that we do. Um, uh, that makes the problem worse. But you're not going to really get away with just making everything easy or simple or stress-free. And I don't think anybody wants that. Tara, mm -hmm. what would you add? Yeah, you know, one of the things I would say is that, you know, Kathy and I do a lot of storytelling, you know, uh, in the book. And, you know, kind of to Kathy's point here, you know, we give an example. We tell this story of Sandra. Now, full disclosure here, we have changed names <laughs> in this Genders, all sorts of things got changed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually innocent. Uh, but but one of the things that that's interesting is that we try to put people in situations that they can imagine themselves in. And so, I mean, we we've been in situations where we've been overly taxed um, at work, and we've been for a variety of reasons. Maybe we're under resourced. Maybe there's too much on our plate. Um, and we have a boss who isn't paying attention to what's going on, who just keeps demanding and demanding and demanding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually people just, you know, they, they, they check out and they ultimately end up walking out of the door. And, and, and we share the story because, you know, we want people to, to understand that when you're not tending to stress in the, in the workplace with your employees, that it, it doesn't go away. Um, it, it builds up and then the employee is then adversely impacted, the team is adversely impacted. And so, you know, what then becomes your responsibility as the leader in that context to actually um, address the situation? I think the challenge sometimes, um, you know, in organizations, and this, this kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier, Jay, about how you and I navigate it. Um, you know, I might do okay with the stressor that comes up in, in the workplace. And so the, you know, the, the manager then assumes that because Tara is okay, the rest of the team must also be okay. And, and you really can't do that because people have different things that they are dealing with. And so even in this moment right now, where when you were in the office, you might have, you know, walked down the hallway or you might have poked your head into a cubicle to just have that, you know, visual, uh, visual, you know, contact, that initial interaction, you've got to try to create that right now in this new virtual context, because you don't have those quick pop in, stop by, you know, to see how people um, are doing, because you and I have this amazing ability, you know, Jeff, to, to uh, create coping mechanisms for ourselves right. that allow us to look like we're okay. And we're actually not. And so this is what we're really trying to say to leaders is we want you to pay attention and, right. and, and look around and, and don't just assume that, you know, that employees are OK, but really trying to affirm that they're OK. And if they're not, let's get in here together to try to figure it out and, and to help you. Yeah, you know, you 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 use the phrase, both of you use the phrase in here, increase the predictability in the process and communications. Uh, to your employees and especially, uh, to, you know, in helping them achieve a sense of control over their stress because you both talk about during stress, people need more information. 
and they probably need it more frequently is what you also add. And then I think the other thing that you, you, you bring up in here, and we probably don't do it enough, is celebrating the success of effort and the attitude and the endurance during stressful times. I think, you know, I, I found those to be really helpful tips uh, for people when it comes to, you know, dealing with stress that we probably don't, we probably don't pay attention to because chances are as the employer, we're stressed, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Hey folks, listen, you, you're the, the book isn't called the demotivated employee and I'm with doctors, Tara Peters and Dr. Uh, Kathy Bush. And you're listening to them or maybe watching them here on a new direction. Hey folks, look, you know, a new direction has got these two great sponsors and I talk about them frequently, but listen, they, their financial support of this show is huge. And so I, I need to say something about them and because I want to, because first of all, I, I use them both and I am so grateful for them, but you know, Epic physical therapy, right. Who's been with us and you know, it doesn't matter what you're recovering from at all. Right. They, it, it, they have not only the, you know, best people, but they got the top of the line equipment, including the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill, taking pressure off your joints to run the compression sleeves, the Normatex that wrap around your joints to make you feel like your joints are back in place and working right. And then there's the game ready. I talk about all the time how much I love that freezing cold water and compression to take the swelling right out of wherever the swelling is. I love them. They are trained and certified in the most comprehensive cutting edge treatments. And here's, you know what, some of my favorites are blood flow restriction therapy, dry needling, which is absolutely fantastic, and cupping. Uh, if you've never seen cupping, it's fantastic. Manipulating the muscle through the skin, it's absolutely awesome, and it's great. Look, folks, don't look anywhere else. If you're looking for epic recovery, epic relief, and epic results, go to epicpt.com. That's E-P-I-C-P-T. Dot com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors for 35 years, you know what they've been doing? They've been making memories. Because what they understand is that, you know, when it comes to the home buying and home selling experience, you know what the truth is? It's really about the memories that you make in the home. It's not about the price, ultimately. Nobody remembers what your grandmother paid for her, her house. But boy, we sure remember the cookies we ate in them, don't we? And that's really what the most important thing is. And that's what Linda and her team are focused on is that this is your memory. And they want to be part of that memory, which means that they want to get you the best value for your home, whether you're buying a new home or whether you want to get the best price for your the home that you're selling. They want to be part of that memory process. So why not go and talk to the memory makers? Start right there. Start with Linda Craft and her team, and it's easy to do. Just go to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we're back here on A New Direction with Dr. Tara Peters and Dr. Kathy Bush. And uh, we're talking about the Demotivated Employee, a fabulous book. Uh, this is part two. Uh, we had Dr. Peters on um, a while back, and uh, the book was so good, we didn't get very far into it, just like we aren't now, <laughs> I feel <laughs> like. Um, but uh, we're having a lot of fun. Uh, in Chapter 5, we talk about another uh, – place that we can be demotivated and it is the organizational culture and you ask the question who can stay motivated in a place like this i think so many employees ask that question man how can i stay how do you want me to stay motivated in this culture right tara talk to us about what it is about the organizational culture that can demotivate us and how do we overcome it so it's it's a great question because obviously you know culture is something that's been studied for for decades now. Um, we talk a little bit about um, Edgar Schein, but we really who is really kind of seems the godfather. But we spend most of the time in the book really talking about Cameron and Quinn, um, who created this uh, this competing values framework uh, back in 2011 to really frame for culture. So we talk about clan and hypocrisy, hierarchy and marketing. And one of the things that's interesting about culture is the issue around the demotivate, demotivating part is that you and I have preferences in terms of how we want to work. So, for example, if I'm an individual who really likes to, you know, have a family type environment, I like building relationships and having close connections. And I really like um, because we build these close relationships, there's lots of free flowing and open communication. Well, if I suddenly find myself in an environment that is more rigid, communication is carefully uh, controlled. Um, it's not really about the, the, the familia part of it but, it, but it's really more so about, you know, following, you know, the chain of command and processes and procedures. 
if I find myself in that role, I prefer the former, right? That's right. what I really wanted. But now the environment or the culture has shifted. And now suddenly that doesn't suit my preferences in the way that I that I like to work. And so what happens to, to you and I is that there can be a mismatch um, between our preferences for working and the actual, uh, you know, company that we are a part of. And it can be hard sometimes, Jay, to be fair, to to get a sense of what the culture is actually like, even if we do all of our homework and we, you know, we spend time in the interviews, right. what we see in that representation may not be what it's like in terms of the, the day to day. And right. so that can become a part of the challenge in terms of, you know, you ask this question, you know, how can anyone, you know, be motivated or how can anyone work in a place like this? Well, it happens because we thought it was going to be one thing. <laughs> and then once we got in there, and we worked a while, you know, things changed um, or it wasn't what we expected it to oh. be. And that becomes a challenge for us. Oh, I, and I've got a story. All right. I, I got I to gotta share the story. So this is a prime example. I thought I wanted to, you know, go and be this college professor, you know, work with college athletes because I, I love the kids. And I, you know, did the, all this research on enhancing academic performance and deficient student athletes. And, and just that was that was all part of my my master's thesis and my, you know, my dissertation proposal and you know what I understand, and you write this in the book by because it was a hierarchy. Uh, it was a hierarchy. That's what that's what universities are. They 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 operate in a hierarchy. The first words that you say when it comes to demotivating, do you know what they are? No avenue for creativity. I am a I am as right brained creative as you get. How do you think I did? in a university setting. I, yeah. I, I struggled. I, okay. I struggled with the rules. I struggled. I was literally called a loose cannon because I just was like, well, I'm going to get this done. So I'm just going to bypass every dean and go right to the provost and say, well, look, this is what I'm trying to get done, but nobody will listen. Will you listen? And then, then the provost comes, well, why aren't you listening to this? And then I get, you know, you're a loose cannon. I now see that it was a badge of honor because I, didn't, I was just in the wrong place. But I mean, that can be a problem. And then you talk about um, you talk about Kathy that sometimes demotivation is because some people have to have a lack of structure, like Google or Apple, right? Talk right, about right, yeah. So you know, I, I've also had similar experiences to to yours, and I've worked for a different few different universities. And so, yeah, when you are built to like structure or your mission requires it, I think healthcare, right? There are a lot of rules right. for safety and life and death reasons. So we need structure. And so when we're built to like that and it fits the work, then it makes sense. Then we can do it, right? But boy, if you're a person who's open and creative and you you want to uh, you know be right brain, you want to innovate, um, you don't need a stinking desk, you can, you know, go for a bike right. ride and sit in the grass and do your job. If that's who you are, and that's not the kind of place you work, then you need other sources of motivation, because right. you're, you're kind of going through the motions um, on this particular culture situation. But not everybody likes that either, right? So right. there are people who are not built for that sort of no structure, no rules, uh, you know, whatever you come up with is okay with us sort of environment. And so it's about mismatch, as Tara said, and understanding when there's a mismatch and then helping a person, um, you know, find the best opportunity to thrive and grow in the place that they're in or finding their way to a place that fits them better. Uh, sometimes that's inside the company. Sometimes that's, you know, a, a mutual agreement that this right. is not a good fit. Yeah. So, so Tara, you talk, you also talk, you guys talk about in the, in the four categories of organizational culture where we can, this is the Cameron and Quinn, I think, 2011. Yeah. Uh, you talk about the marketplace. And when I talk about market, we're talking about like, and because I have so many people from the mortgage industry, matter of fact, who are listening right now or watching, uh, mortgage industry, residential, real estate, sales industry, th that's the market uh, area. And they get demotivated by production goals and burnout. Is this something, I'm, I'm, as, I'm, as I'm doing this, now I'm shooting from the hip here, I'm sorry, but I'm starting to think through this and say, you know, maybe... You, people need to pay attention to these things a little bit closer because, you know, if you say you want – everybody wants to get into real estate right now. <laughs> I just find it funny right. because I'm like going – if 
the demotivation piece is that you talk about a production goals and burnout. So let's talk about the market because people want to be mortgage lenders, real estate people and salespeople right now. So, I mean, so here's the thing. All of these cultures that we talk about have a, have the capacity to demotivate in, in, in some uh, some some way. So so what becomes important, I think, as as a as a leader is to attend to it. So if I know that, again, it's just it's just the nature of the beast. Right. It is a highly competitive environment. It is productivity driven. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to meet certain outcomes. It's how we it's how we eat It's how we make our money. So we understand that. But then what I also have to recognize as a as a leader is, OK, how do I then try to balance that against the downside of this? Right. So people are pedaling really, really hard. They're working really, really long hours um, that over an extended period of time can lead to, to burnout. So what are the kinds of things that I can help to counterbalance that? So, for example, can I give people more control um, and flexibility mm. um, over their schedule? Maybe that becomes an option that I make available um, to employees. Uh, So for our purposes, we really want you to take a look at your culture as a whole and say, okay, even if we have had a successful culture in the past, we don't maintain that accidentally. I mean, there are things that you and I as leaders that we need to make sure that we are doing to ensure that a good thing doesn't go awry. Um, and so I think paying attention and then being prepared to make accommodations or changes as appropriate, I think really becomes the becomes necessary um, if, if leaders are going to help employees to continue to meet standards um, and to, again, maintain the, the culture that has allowed the organization to, to thrive. Uh, that's awesome. By the way, we're talking with uh, Dr. Dr. Tara Peters and Dr. Kathy Bush. The book's called The Demotivated Employee. Um, it's a fabulous read. By the way, it, it's it's not a long read, but man, it is jam-packed full of great information for you, whether you're an employer, a manager, or an employee for that matter, because I think we all need to evaluate uh, ourselves uh, in, you know, maybe we're not doing it like I did. You know, I was working in university and you know what? It wasn't working out for me. I thought this is what I wanted to do, but it just didn't. Maybe you're into real estate and you can't figure out why you just don't have that, you know, you don't have that oomph that, that go. Maybe you're in mortgage and you just can't figure out why it's not working. Well, you you may be because you're totally demotivated because you're in the wrong culture. Um, for yourself. So uh, that's why it's so valuable. And that's why I really recommend that you pick this up. I'm going to jump ahead to chapter seven to leadership style um, because we're running short of time here. And which, by the way, just blows me away every time I do the show. <laughs> it goes so fast. Um, of course, I'm a tigger, right? You know, so. Right. This, yeah. if, so of course. Of course. Who, I, knew? who knew? Who knew that I was a tigger, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we would have never guessed it. No, so. we didn't, right? you didn't never guess. The most wonderful thing about tiggers is the tiggers are a wonderful thing. Their tops are made of the river. The bombs are made of the string. They're bouncy, 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 fun, 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 fun. Okay, so anyway, uh, yes, I am a tigger, and I just did the uh, tigger song for those of you who are playing at home. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who are listening in a foreign country, uh, just look up Winnie the Pooh and you will hear that voice of Tigger. Uh, so <laughs> Buckingham and Kaufman in 1999 uh, are famous for a quote that uh, people leave managers, not companies. So let's start with Tara this time. Tara, uh, well, actually, let's go to, let's go to Kathy. Uh, Kathy, so uh, let's talk about leadership style and are people leaving you or the company. Let's talk about that. What what are some of the main factors of leadership style that can demotivate us as an employee? And then talk about how we can uh, overcome that, and then we'll get Tara's view. So um, in the book, and in particular in Chapter 7, we have what we refer to as the six failures of leadership. And so it's important to kind of recognize that throughout the entire book, we're speaking to leaders. And frankly, anybody who sees another person and cares about their performance would qualify here. But we're saying throughout the book, there are things leaders do and and things they maybe shouldn't do and things that they can do. In chapter seven, we're really focused on the relationship between an employee and his or her boss and how important that relationship is. So when you are working and it doesn't matter what else is going on around you, your boss is available to you and helps you solve problems. Um, your boss hangs out and gives you feedback when you're in a meeting or when you're doing something in a timely and an effective manner with enough information that you really know that she saw what you were doing and cares enough to help you get better. 
when your boss do, does those things, gives you some extra coaching, put some time into you, um, helps you kind of solve some problems, those things tell you, man, I, I love this boss, this boss loves me, wants me to be successful. It's very hard um, to lose a person and have all their motivation kind of get flushed away when they know that their boss cares about them, right? So even if their motivation gets challenged a bit, they, their boss is there for them. And so that relationship is super, super critical. Of course, the opposite, and we refer to them as the failures, the opposite is also true. So if your boss is nowhere to be found and you're in a crisis, um, if your boss talks about you but doesn't talk to you, mm -hmm. right? If your boss is only one kind of thing but not the thing you need at that point in time, right. um, then you're really frustrated. And so that might be the primary reason you leave. So right. th those, are, uh, those are really, really critical things for us as leaders of people to pay attention to. And, and so to kind of just add to what like Kathy was saying, so those failures, we, we call them out. And so we, we list six of them specifically. And it's a failure to explain the why, uh, failure to communicate frequently and clearly, failure to invite input and opinions, failure to provide effective feedback and coaching, failure to remove obstacles, and then failure to adjust your your leadership styles. And so what we're really trying to get leaders to do is, again, this is, you know, based on, on research that Kathy and I did in, in writing the book and saying, you need to pay attention to these things right. um, because there's a consequence that goes back to the point that you raised earlier, Jay, that people leave managers, they leave their boss. They're not leaving their jobs. They're leaving right. you. <laughs> right. right. Um, and so what can we help leaders to do in order uh, to, to reduce the likelihood of that happening. Yeah, th th it's just fantastic. Uh, I, these six failures are so critical. Um, leaders, I really suggest that you, I'm, I'm just going to restate them again. I, I know Tara did, but failure to explain why, failure to communicate frequently and clearly, failure to invite input, uh, failure to provide effective feedback and coaching, failure to remove obstacles, and failure to adjust your leadership style. I just, I think these six failures are so critical uh, to leaders to work with. Ladies, I hate to do this, but we have come to the end of our time. So uh, I, I've had a blast with both of you. Um, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. I hope you've had a lot of fun too. Um, it's been great. Thank you. Uh, it's been a time, Jay. Glad to be with you again. <laughs> so so here's the deal. Uh, I ask you, uh, the show's called A New Direction because we try to help people find a new direction in their life, their career, their business and leadership and success. So starting with you, Kathy, if you could leave the people with a new direction, what would be your new direction for uh, the people listening in the audience? Um, I guess I would say it sounds maybe simple to say this, but for me, when you notice other people, um, rather than assuming you know what's going on, involve yourself in a conversation, show them you care, ask them how they're doing, help them solve it. Uh, so it's quick and easy for us to just kind of size people up and have an opinion. Stop doing that. Involve yourself and help people out. Beautiful. Tara, Dr. Tara Peters, what would be your new direction? So if I was going to say a new direction, I would go back to something you said at the beginning of your show, uh, Jay, about the four trainings. And so the the part about the, the mental piece about learning, um, you know, I think this is really a, an opportunity for those who seize it um, to grow and to develop in important ways, um, to learn a new skill or a new talent. And that will require you to immerse yourself in something. It might require you to unlearn uh, right. something that you may have previously held uh, to be true. But I would just encourage people to work on the, that really that learning part that you talked about earlier and try to move their number uh, right. to the next number, whatever that might be for them. Awesome. Folks, listen. Uh, the book is entitled The Demotivated Employee. I will have the links to both their, to the book, to the websites for each of them and the write-up. So when this goes out, you can just, uh, whether it's iTunes, iHeartRadio, or everywhere, you can, you'll can you be able to find their links back to them and uh, to the book. They have been outstanding. Folks, listen, um, you know what? The show's called A New Direction. We're easy to find. But you know what we could also use? We could also use you to subscribe and like our show and give a positive comment about our show. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, 
You know what? You can find it all at jizo.com. That's J-A-Y-I-Z-S-O.com. And so, you know, that's how you can find them. That's how you can find their books. That's how you can find stuff about me as well. But you can find the show certainly there. So please check that out at jizo.com. And as I say every week, you know what? Be inspired because when you're inspired, that means you will inspire other people. And when they become inspired, that means they inspire others. And that can make this world a magical place. Folks, I'll be back next week with another great book and an absolutely fantastic fabulous guest and as I say to you every week ciao everybody to go a different way yeah the time has come for a new direction yeah yeah new direction yeah yeah when you lost your confidence and the answers don't make sense Got to keep your hope alive. You got to know you can survive. This is your time to find a new direction, a brand new day. A new direction, things are gonna change. You can find the strength to go a different way. Your dreams will take you places you 